Hey everybody, good evening. Good to have you here. It is Monday the 8th of April 2024. Beautiful day in Boise. The sun is out right now. A little chilly, but um, perfect. Like It's going to only get better. Uh, we did not... I'm Nate Eaton, by the way. This is Courtroom Insider. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, let us know where you're watching from and go ahead and subscribe wherever you're watching because things are about to get really interesting in this Chad Daybell trial starting this week. We're going to go through everything that happened today in the courtroom and what is expected ahead. Uh, also, if you saw the eclipse, post some photos. I've been watching the news coverage and seeing some of your pictures that you've been sending in. I honestly didn't see anything here in Boise. Um, I was outside, I think, when it passed, but... Nothing like 2017 in Idaho Falls when we had the path of totality. It was amazing. It was uh, one of the things that lived up to the hype and even exceeded it, in my opinion. And I said to my wife at the time, we got to go to Niagara Falls next, next time there's an eclipse. That would have been now. The timing wasn't the best. So I hope that if you were able to see the eclipse, you enjoyed it. And I appreciate you joining in tonight. Full show ahead. We have a lot happening tonight. Let's get straight to it. We have a jury. Yes, it took five days, but we have the jury. And coming up tonight, we're going to talk about what exactly happened in court. It was a short court day. Started late, ended early. My kind of day. Uh, and we're going to talk about who is on that jury. We have reaction from Larry Woodcock. Kay and Larry arrived in Boise over the weekend, and they were in the courtroom today. Tom Evans, he's juror number 18 in Lori Vallow's case. He was there experiencing it from the other side this past week versus, uh, nope, there we go, versus before when he was an actual juror when he was picked. We have a body expert and a jury consultant. Her name is Susan Constantine. You may have seen her all over the place. She's been on Dr. Phil, Nancy Grace, all the shows. She's been at CrimeCon. I wanted to chat with her today about what attorneys look for when they're picking a jury. Like, what are the characteristics they're looking for? What does a defense attorney look for? What does a prosecutor look for? We get into all of that. This woman has uh, done consulting work for the Michael Jackson trial. She's done uh, other trials. She, she really knows her stuff. So we're going to talk with her. Pretty interesting conversation, in my opinion. We're going to talk about what's next. Because there's always stuff coming down the line, and we're going to remember JJ, Tylee, and Tammy. So let's get straight to it. Oh, don't forget, we have your questions that we want to answer too. So no matter where you're watching from, please give us your questions because um, I get a lot of information uh, out of those questions, or I get a lot of uh, feedback as far as what you're interested in when you have those questions. So you can post them on YouTube if you're watching on YouTube. If you're watching on Facebook, post them there. Post them wherever you're watching from, and we will go through those and answer a few at the end. And also, many of you, I, I do want to say, <laughs> a lot of you have been emailing or messaging me and saying, why don't you respond to me? I, I try to respond to as many as I can, so please don't be offended if I don't get to you. Uh, what I found with Lori Vallow's trial is after the trial was over for like a month, all of uh, June, I was responding to people finally. Or if your question's already been answered, I assume that you know the answer and that you have uh, researched it. So that's why I'm not responding to it. So that's where um, that's where things stand with the questions. Now, you might recall when we left on Friday, there was over 50, I believe there was 57 jurors in the pool. Judge Boy said, we'll stop at 50. He went a little longer, did more for good measure, just in case there was any issue. And it's a good thing he went more than 50 because today we had one no-show. A juror did not show up. Don't know where he was. I remember which one he was because I took notes on each of them, but he didn't show up. So that took the pool down. One no longer lives in the county. She moved out of Ada County. Legally, you have to live in the county. So she had to be removed from the pool. So out of those, let's say there were 57, could have been down to 55. There could have been one or two others that dropped that dropped out over the weekend, or not dropped out necessarily, but just couldn't do it um, because of other reasons. So I'm going to say we had over 50 remaining. I do not know the exact amount. I, I think it was around 55, 54, but there were so many numbers being thrown around today. I don't want to tell you falsely 
and then have you come back and say, you said there were this many, because I'm not 100% sure. I do know, though, that there were over 50. The bottom line is it really doesn't matter because um, those who were over 50 were dismissed. So it was basically the majority of those that were picked on Friday were able to leave. They didn't need them anymore. Their jury service was done. And then we had peremptory challenges. So there was a little bit of settling things down, getting down to number 50. Here is the definition of a peremptory challenge from the Cornell Law School. A peremptory challenge results in the exclusion of a potential juror without the need of any read or explanation. And the process was like someone on Twitter, and I agree, said it was kind of like a tennis match. So they bring in all the 50, they sit, sit them down, they each are carrying their red cards with their numbers on them, they take a roll call, they're all there, and then the prosecution and the defense each has a list of all of their numbers. The prosecutor starts, it's like, it's quiet, it's like church, but no fussy babies, just quiet. The, the um, no Cheerios either. The, the, um, the prosecution starts and they'll go through and mark one that they don't want. It then goes to John Pryor. He then sees who they marked. He then marks one. Then goes back to the prosecutor so they know who Pryor chose. Then it goes up to the judge and he mark he takes note of who was picked. Then back to the prosecutor, back to the defense, back to the prosecutor, up to the judge. 16 times they each get 16 people to eliminate. 16 peremptory challenges. It took about 30, 35 minutes, based on my count, to go through this. Everyone, as I said, is sitting in silence. There's not much happening. We're watching a paper go back and forth. The jurors are over there. Many were just watching. Some had their heads down. Some, I'm sure, were thinking, please, no, please, no. Some were probably thinking, I hope I get picked. Some were probably didn't know what to think. But you had a mix of, of younger adults to older adults. And John, they had arranged the courtroom. So instead of the benches facing the judge this way with the judge up here, they were turned. So Pryor and Chad Daybell sat on this side. The judge was in the middle and the prosecutor sat on this side facing the gallery. They had everybody in the gallery, those of us watching, on the left side of the courtroom. And then on the right side were all of the jurors. And I was, I came and sat down directly in front of Chad on purpose. He was maybe 15, 10 to 15 feet in front of me. We did make eye contact for a moment, uh, but he was chatting with his attorney. John Pryor did not consult with Chad at all, at least in the courtroom, about which jurors they were going to pick. The, the prosecution would whisper with each other, talk with each other, things like that. But uh, uh, Chad Daybell did not. Now, it's possible they could have met before, like in the jail, and said, oh, I want this one. Or he just said, John Pryor, you choose them all. So after 35 minutes, we come back, and here's who we've got. 18 jurors, 12 uh, actual jurors, and 6 alternates. 10 men and 8 women. I originally thought from my seat that there were more women than men, but nope, there's actually more men than women. And here's just some interesting tidbits. The very first person that was brought, that was accepted in the very first pool of jurors, I'm going to pull up my notes, she made it through. So she was the, the very first one that they had on Monday, a week ago Monday. She, um, her juror number 27. I'm not going to talk too much about the jurors. Like I have notes I just want to be really careful. They, according to Judge Boyce, they had expressed some concerns for their privacy, and I don't blame them, and some for their confidentiality. If you really want to go back and watch all of the all of the jury selection, you can learn about them and hear their voices. Um, but this is a woman, mother of four, and is in favor of the death penalty. I'll, I'll just tell you that. She was the very first one from the very first group who made it through. And she's now on the jury. From day one, it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven from day one made it to the final selection. From day two, only one. The second, the, another person from day two was not a resident. 
from day three from Wednesday. One, two, three. Looks like three made it through from Wednesday. From Thursday, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then from Friday, one. I believe that's right. So we have a mix of those who support the death penalty and those who oppose it. I would say the majority support, support it or favor it. And um, in fact, I, I see maybe one who said they were opposed to the death penalty. But again, most of these people, their, their feelings were kind of, they would follow whatever the judge said. In fact, all of them said that. So they're, you know, it's not like you have these people that are like, yeah, put them to death right away. But they do, they are not adamantly opposed to the death penalty. So that gives us the 18 that we needed. Now they won't know who they are if they're the alternates or the jurors until the end at least that's how it could be judge that's how judge boyce did it with Lori vallow they didn't know till right before deliberations he could tell them on wednesday that's when we're next in court wednesday so there is no court tomorrow no court tomorrow so many of you emailed and messaged saying where are you why aren't you doing anything court started late today it started at 10 and we were out by well actually started at like 10 20 we were out by noon nothing tomorrow but Wednesday, boom, 8.30, things kick off. Be here. Be sure you have subscribed because you're going to get the alert the second we go live and you don't want to miss opening statements. That will set the tone for the entire trial. Opening statements, closing arguments. Those are the things you want to hear and then boom, we'll go straight into witness number one. That's all Wednesday morning at 8.30. So, okay, I want to uh, play you a little bit of Larry Woodcock. He was here, as I mentioned. We caught up with him right after jury selection ended. And this is what he had to say, about a three minutes piece. Um, you know, it's it's wild that we've been doing this for four years, over four years now. But Larry was here. Kay was here. They were looking good. They're ready for this to get going. Here is what Larry had to say. All right, Larry, what was it like walking in the courthouse today? It was deja vu all over again. Uh, this time, so much less stress. Why is that? I, I think we fought the battle with Laurie because we loved Laurie. We trusted Laurie. She, let, she lost that trust. Uh, I've seen the worst. I've heard the worst. And I just... I feel like there's evidence that we have not heard and there's probably some evidence that we have not seen but I think that Kay and I our family are prepared for this and more so than the first time because we were newbies the first time I think a lot of people were newbies to this and uh, I just I feel like that we're better we're in a better place mentally physically, emotionally. What do you, um, what was it like seeing Chad right there 10 feet in front of you? You know, seeing Chad in front of me was a little disappointing in the fact that I, I just, I, I look at Chad and I don't look at Chad, I look at the photographs that I saw of JJ the remains of Tylee and Tammy for oh, what? It, 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 it never made sense. I don't think it ever will make sense. So in, in looking at, at Chad, um, I, I just don't have any, I don't, I don't feel anything. I really don't. Mm. So uh, a lot less stress this time around, and um, any any prediction on how long this trial will take? What are you thinking? I will never have a prediction about that. If we walked in Monday morning and they said they have reached a verdict, uh, a wit, I mean a, a, plea, a plea, that's fine. I, I've come to grips with the death penalty. I was adamant about it when this happened. I was angry. I was angry beyond 
I, I just couldn't even help myself. Now, there's worse things than dying in life. So what would you say to the, the Daybell family as far as Tammy's siblings and parents? This trial is, is for them, I mean, this is about Tammy and the man they knew. They didn't really know Lori. Any advice you'd share for them? What I want to share with them is I have never stopped praying for his family. I know what I've gone through, and I honestly can't imagine what his children are going through. I feel for him, and I, and I feel for his family. And the, the brothers in that family, I love. I, I consider them friends. But, you know, we're all going through this together, and I think emotionally we're, we're bound and bonded. Okay, anything you want to add? Right. Thank y'all, and thanks for caring for Kay and I. We love y'all. Good. All right, there you go. Larry is one of those people, he walks in the courtroom, and um, hold on one second. I'm a little out of focus. This TV behind me, there we go. Hopefully that works. Uh, Larry walks in the courtroom and um, courthouse, and, you know, Every, he's just a friend to everybody. He's just great. And um, I do have to tell you, I, I observed the attorneys are under this gag order. They can't talk to any anyone like witnesses. We can't we're not supposed to approach them about the case. Nothing. So it's, everyone's being like super, super sensitive. We don't want to get in trouble. Things like that. Larry walks up to John Pryor this morning and says, hi, how, how you doing? John Pryor said, I can't say a word. <laughs> Larry pats him on the back really hard. Well, good luck. <laughs> Something like that. It was pretty funny. But but that shows that Larry went over and he did the same thing with John Thomas and Jim Archibald during Lori's trial. So they're, they'll be here every day. Um, and But for them, the big thing was Lori. But as I mentioned in that interview, for Tammy Daybell's family, the big thing for this is Chad. They didn't know Lori, but the... They know Chad. They knew him. They've known him for years and decades, and this isn't the man they knew. So all of the emotions and thoughts and, and everything that L Larry and Kay had last year, now Tammy's family will have. So it's it's kind of kind of flipped, and we'll see. And, and many of you are asking, are they going to be there? Well, many of them have subpoenas, so they can't be there because they have to testify. I'm told, though, that some others will be coming. Vicki Hoban, their aunt, uh, Tammy Daybell's aunt, she's been there every day thus far, and she plans to be here for the duration. So after the jury was picked, the judge said, let's return on Wednesday. That's when I'll swear you in. He told them, avoid the media. Don't talk to anybody about the case. You're going to get instructions on where to meet because they, they're not going to be driving their own cars in. They're going to meet somewhere off site and get in vans and be driven in that way. And this secure entrance, they're going to have a bailiff with them at all times. If anybody approaches them and tries to talk about the case, the judge is to be alerted. I mean, this is high, high stakes stuff. If I were to walk into a grocery store and see one, I would likely turn around and leave. I wouldn't even want, want to get in any sort of trouble like that. Um, but... After I, I caught up with Tom Evans outside the courthouse to get his thoughts, because he's been watching this whole thing from the other side, as I mentioned. And here's what Tom had to say about the whole process. So, Tom, what was it like being in there today, seeing the jury selection finalized? Bring back memories? Yeah, it brings back memories. I think it was like a year ago, almost to the day that I was in that same spot that those people are in. I kind of feel for them. I know what they're going through right now. What was the difference between observing it versus actually being there? Uh, it's a whole lot different being on this side, and especially because I've been through it. Now I know what's going on. When I was in their shoes, I had no idea what was happening. Yeah. So, um, what do you remember when you were dismissed? What did you do at that point? You go home and tell your wife? Well, we were first taken to the jury room and given instructions and told that we would be you know, dri driven into the courtroom in vans and all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. And then, yeah, home to the wife yeah. with shocking news. So you've been here almost every day last week. What what have you uh, observed or learned that was different maybe than what being on the other side of it last year? 
Um, well, like what stood out to you? As far as what? Jury selection. Oh, um, I don't know. Not a whole lot, really. I mean, it just kind of is what it is. There's, there's a lot of potential jurors. It was interesting just to watch people's answers to their questions, I guess, more than anything. Right. Uh, just because there were so many of them, I, I got to see more people answer the questions. So some of them, that their answers weren't quite what you would expect. That was kind of fun. Right. All right, are you coming here Wednesday for opening? I will be here, yeah. yeah and and you, are you, what, what's your prediction? How you think it'll go quicker, longer than Lori's? Oh boy, I haven't thought that far ahead. I really don't have a prediction yet. Yeah. Okay, anything you want to add? Um, I don't think so, other than um, go to Hope House and look for my book on my website. And, um, Hope House is the organization I'm donating to. Right, you can you can pre-order it now. Yeah, it's ready for pre-orders, right? Thank you. Yeah, so you can pre-order it through your website and tell everybody yeah. where the profit, where the proceeds go. The proceeds are going to Hope House, the, their organization that benefits children in need. So it's a really worthy thing. Okay. Okay, so there you go. He has a website. You can go check that out, and um, if you want to to get his book. It's called uh, Money, Power, Sex, I believe, and it's on there. It's not out yet. It's coming out when the when Chad Daybell's trial is over, and you can um, pre-order it now, though, and, and he wanted to wait to release it, of course, till after Chad's trial is out. But he'll be there every day, and it's interesting to hear his perspective. Um, I did – a bunch of you were questioning, like, are we allowed this media – or in the public, are you all allowed to talk to the jurors if you see them in the grocery store? You can. You just can't talk. You're not supposed to talk about the case. They're not supposed to talk about the case or be told anything about the case. It's very hard to do that. Um, and most people, unless you're in the courtroom every day, you would not know they're a juror. And um, so if you're in Albertsons tonight and you see one, you can't go up. You shouldn't go up and be like, I saw you're on the jury. They're probably going to be freaked out. They could report you to the judge and you could get hauled in in front of the judge. Now, for the group, that what, the 32 that left today, they can talk. In fact, if you're watching and want to talk, message me or you know them. They can talk because they're not on the jury. They could talk about their experience and their experience is probably going to be like, well, I filled out a survey, a, a questionnaire. I showed up at the courthouse. I found out this was the case. I got questioned. I made it to the final pool. I was really nervous and I was happy or not happy that I got picked. Um, but I mean, it's an interesting story. I I've asked you this every night. I think this week, would you want to be on the jury? And do you think you could keep an open unbiased mind and not do you, or do you automatically think he's guilty or not guilty? Because it's those people that have not really heard about it. And those people that are keeping an open mind that, that who they're going to be looking for. And they found them. They found them today. They found the final ones. Okay. So, um, now I want to play you an interview I did just about an hour ago. I um, was thinking, who could I have on to talk about like jury selection, like a jury consultant, someone who knows this stuff? Because how do you know which ones to pick? There were some that were picked that I thought, mm, spot on. There was one who was picked who didn't show up his during his assigned day. He overslept and his clock, his phone didn't go off, but he came the next day. He's on the jury. And I was thinking, well, I wonder why him. But then I, I kind of realized maybe they like because he has this quality. He doesn't have kids. So maybe they like that, that he's not a parent or, or whatever. I don't know. I don't know why they pick these things. But there are big, huge cases like the Michael Jackson case, who my next guest worked on, where they hire consultants to do all sorts of work on this. There's shows, there's there's movies made about this very thing. Now, I don't believe that the prosecution and the defense hired consultants for this case, but I'm sure that they were looking for specific, um, specific things, you know, like specific attributes, whatever. And that's why I, I reached out to a couple of con connections in the industry. I said, hey, who do you know who could talk on this? They said, Susan Constantine, you've got to get her on. Reached out to her. She said, yeah, I'll do it. I've just been, she, she had actually just watched a show I had done here, Courtroom Insider or, or something like that. She said, I want to talk about the case. So we recorded this about an hour ago because she had to go do some like court TV stuff. And I want to play you this. The interview was fascinating to me as far as learning about what people look through on the jury. If you have any questions too, 
uh, post them here. Here we go. Susan, can we just start off with you kind of giving me your background? Sure. Um, I'm a body language. It helps if I hit the right button. <laughs> Hold on a minute. Sorry about that. Yeah, okay. I think we have it now. No, we don't. I told you this just happened. This interview just happened. So I've got it right here. I apologize for this. Here we go. Let me take it full. Thank you for your patience. I'm not a technical person. Susan, can we just start off with happy. you kind of giving me your background? Okay, sure. stay with me. Um, I'm a body stay language expert. I think you can hear her, but you can't see her, right? I'm going to fix that, I hope. For some reason, my one computer doesn't like the other computer when it comes to video, so it does this. It likes to be funny or something like that. I know that this never happens to any of you, but it's just me here. I don't have like a director. I don't have a producer. It's me. So thank you for bearing with me. While that uploads, um, I think that I'm going to get you some questions. I think that we can start with our questions. Actually, first of all, let me do some shout outs. Um, Wendy Greiten in Norway. Good. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Wendy, for watching. Wench. No, Wench Greiten. Sorry. Wench Greiten. Vicki Snyder. Sally Etheridge. Thank you. Shannon Shepard. Robin Brusso. Is that how you say it? Thank you, Robin. Lisa Whitney. Mike Owen. Marcy Bardowski. Diana Stewart. And, or Diane Stewart. Carrie Carr and Catherine Numet, Lindsay Sleeman, hi Tanner. <laughs> hi Tanner. I hope you and Lindsay are enjoying the program. Uh, Galaxy Dreamer watching from Hungary. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you. And a, a personal shout out from me. So I've told you that during lunch breaks, uh, during the trial, I go and I eat in my car. I don't, I, cause it's so quick. I don't have time to go anywhere and gives me a minute to just kind of decompress. But today I thought, oh, court got out at noon and I didn't I didn't have any anything to do. I mean, I had stuff to do, but I didn't have um I didn't have to go back to court. So I said, I'm going to go go out for lunch. And I ended up at Longhorn, one of my favorite places. I'm like, I'm going to go fancy today for lunch. I'm going to get a steak. So I got there, I got in my booth. Also, one thing about me, I don't mind dining alone. I know some people that freaks them out. I don't mind at all. But but do you? Some people, like, they hate to go out to eat alone and sit in the booth alone. I don't mind. I set up my computer, put on my earbuds. I'm working away. The waitress comes. I order. She comes back. We, she, very nice. Great service. Order the food. At the end, she brings me the bill. She goes, I just have to say. I listen to your, I, I love your reporting and I listen to courtroom insider every night and I, with my earbuds or every morning when I'm doing the dishes. So Kathy from Longhorn, thank you. You did a great job with that. Thanks for your patience. Here is Susan Constantine, how to spot a liar in seven seconds. That's her, one of her things and a whole lot more. Cross your fingers. Let's hope this works. Susan, can we just start off with you kind of giving me your background? Sure. Um, I'm a body language expert and I'm also a trial consultant. So I've been a trial consultant for over 20 years and I have covered cases and clients of mine include Jeffrey Epstein, one of the assault victims and the Michael Jackson case or some of the, of the few. Oh, wow. Okay. So what exactly do you do when you're hired to come into a trial to consult? Okay. So consulting with a trial can be from a lot of different areas. So I can either do focus groups or we do whisper groups where we do social mining. So we want to know what the public opinion might be so that we're doing all this pre-trial intelligence before the trial so that when attorneys go in and they've already tested their arguments, we have a good idea how the jury, as we do several of them to determine, you know, what they're actually thinking is. And, and then also how can we then change the narrative so that maybe we can change public opinion. That's one of the pieces of it. The other part of it is witness preparation. So getting the client ready, you know, for her case, his or her case for in one of the cases like the Jeffrey Epstein case, since it was a sexual assault case and I had to work with her, I think five different times to meet with her in the team and watch her demeanor, see how she's presenting, and then also work with her and, you know, creating this, uh, persona of what she actually experienced because a lot of times these victims don't feel like victims 
Right. They feel like they, you know, they, they, they want well, to take that back. They don't necessarily feel like they're victims. They don't realize that they've been victimized. Mm. So they take a lot of responsibility. So, and then, and then another case is like with the Michael Jackson case and other cases, this is, I mean, it's not every day I get a, a case that comes through my desk. It's either a uh, innocence project or someone's got a, a family member who is in jail or in prison, you know, they need help um, analyzing video, you know, determining whether the person is being truthful or not the person that that might have been a suspect, but they haven't really charged the person lots of missing person cases hmm. so there's a lot of uh, cold cases that are out there and of course being out there in the media people hear and see what i do and then i get calls and i help them i help the attorneys to understand and to reveal to them areas and maybe a statement or whether it's in a um, voice stress analysis um, whether it's a 911 call if they're being deceptive or not Right. And if well, they are, where are they deceptive? And then how can the how can the attorneys use that to impeach a witness? Right. Okay. So you have a case like this one, which is very high profile here in Idaho and, and nationwide. It's been on Dateline, Court TV, you know, all over the place. One would think that you have a man accused of murdering this ch these children and his wife, and the kids are buried in the backyard, and the wife dies in the house, and his new wife was found guilty last year and sentenced to three life sentences one might think well this is a slam dunk case you know what 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 why why do you even need to worry about any of this stuff so how how do you respond to that because it's not it's really not that simple it's due process you have to go through it you know it is it this is his opportunity as a you know a, of a resident of the united states has the right to a fair trial so even though everything looks like it's stacked against him, look at the Casey Anthony case. I'm right here in Orlando. I reported on that case from the very beginning. I was in the courtroom every day. I was on the set with Court TV when they came up with a verdict of not guilty. All of us were stunned. So mm -hmm. there are times where there could be something that twists and turns in a trial. You have no idea what could happen. You know, okay. uh, attorney misconduct. There could be tainting evidence it could literally that could be anything and the both sides are going to be like in a boxing match to win that's what it's going to be like right. so they're going to pull out every gun that they can and point it at the opposite side because the whole point is is that what what, what a win for him is no death penalty if he gets life in prison he's lucky right because the death penalty is on the table so there's that for an attorney and especially with a defense, if they can save them, their client from death, they feel like they've got a win, a huge win. Right. So we spent all of last week trying to get that jury pool up to 50 and it even went a little over just for safety. And then it was whittled down today to the 18, 12 jurors, six mm -hmm. alternates. Are are the defense looking for specific characteristics in these jurors versus the prosecutors? Because there were a lot of moms with young kids that some made it through, some didn't. There were a lot of single guys. I mean, what what kind of things in your guess are, are these different sides looking for? Okay. Well, there's a lot of um, pieces to the puzzle. So you're looking at a researcher here. So I don't just walk in and there and just go deselect a jury. There's a lot of work that needs to go in it to determine what jurors you should be selecting, right? So there, in, in every jurisdiction, every state is different. Every circumstance is different. So in this case, yes, there's young children. Uh, uh, children would identify, our parents would identify with those that are having young children. Certainly, what? The defense would want them off. State would want them on, okay? So just keep in mind, everything that the defense wants, the state doesn't want. So it's kind of that woven picture. The other thing is you look at demographics, right? Their age, ethnicity, occupation, level of education, if they've served on a jury before, how many children they have, what their spouse's occupation is. Um, all of this stuff plays into whether they tend to be more egalitarian, which is more pro-defense, or more pro-prosecution, pro which is more authoritarian. In this case, the state are looking for high authoritarians. Also, I think that what we're looking for is there's just so much evidence here. Those jurors are going to be looking for a lot of evidence, especially today 
with true crime being so popular, and especially if there are a lot of women that are selected on there, like 35% of all women in the middle age household are all true, true crimers. Hmm. So that, you know, something to think about true crime magazines, true, true, true crime books. Are they watching Nancy Grace? Are they watching Court to be? Are they watching your show? Yeah. You know, this is the things that they're going to want to whittle down. Right. Um, on top of that, you know, we look at, you know, they're, uh, well, here there, we've got a big religious um, community, right? We've got Mormons and many Mormons don't have the same philosophy of his group because that's really more of the cult uh, religion, right? So right. you've got m some Mormon um, uh, followers, right? That are appalled with the fact that they have twisted their truth and then created a different narrative, right? Now we've got people that, uh, are more conspiracy theorists, right? Because this has a lot of twists and turns and, you know, the aliens and, and portals and all this other kind of stuff. You, you know, does the defense want some people that are just dumb as a rock? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, and they're, and those kind of things, well, yeah, maybe. I mean, shoot, we had an eclipse today. Almost anything could have happened. And, right. you know, anything could have happened. We were waiting for the locusts to start to envelop our, <laughs> you know, right. seriously. Um, I also think that for the defense, they are looking for people that, of course, everyone's looking for unbiased people, but defense are looking for those types of people that are thinking, what if, maybe, well, I'm not sure. You have to convince me, right? So it's not for the, the defense to prove anything. It's for the state to prove their case. So that's what they need to come in with tying all these pieces together, right? I mean, what is the chances of all these people dying and the two people that are now, one of them's already been convicted, the other one was is now here being tried, for the mere reason that he's here will give those jurors a feeling that he had to have done something wrong, otherwise he wouldn't be sitting in the courtroom. Yeah. Wow. Well, what a fascinating profession. I'm sure you've seen so much. And, and you mentioned the Casey Anthony was a shocker, that verdict. Have you had others along the way that you're you're totally just kind of blown away at what the jury comes back with? You know, I wasn't totally blown away, um, but I was surprised. I was there at the George Zimmerman case. Now that was another one here, mm -hmm. right? In my own backyard, I attended that. And a lot of us thought that he was going to be guilty too, right? We really did. Just because of all of the racial tension. It was like you almost had to convict him. Mm -hmm. You know, so the fact that he was found not guilty didn't mean he was innocent. That what was concerning, and especially being in that courtroom, we were concerned about rioting. And that was a huge factor. In fact, there was an entire row inside the courtroom that were um, pastors from uh, African-American pastors and white pastors and Hispanic pastors all joining together in a row to say we're united in order to be, un they wanted to be united so they would de-escalate any sort of rioting because they were saying we want this to be the peacemakers, right? So mm -hmm. I was, um, I know that was a really interesting case is to sit all the way through. Um, I'm actually writing about this case in my book. So you're going to have to find out a little bit more of what I saw inside that courtroom. You have to wait and see. When's the book coming out? In January. Does that have a title? How to Spot a Liar in Seven Seconds or Less. Okay. And I'm going to throw out a pitch here because you've okay. been at CrimeCon. Are you going yeah. to be there at end of May? Yeah. And I'm doing, a, we're doing a really cool myself and Daniel Singer, who selected the jury for the Casey Anthony trial, which regrets it but she will be there. She's my co-partner. She's done multiple high profile cases, a slender man. And I can't, you gotta, you just gotta be there to see it. So her and I are doing the first crime court. So we are setting the scene for future crime cons and doing crime con court where we're doing a focus group. We're explaining everybody the ins and outs, the jury selection 101, what happens behind the scenes. And then we're setting the stage for doing interactive um, presentations in the future with CrimeCon. Oh, wow. Okay, I'm coming to that. Yeah. My wife really was upset that we missed your How to Spot a Liar in Seven Seconds oh. was it a year or two ago. We were in another thing. And so 
we'll we'll see you this year. That's for sure. Well, it, you'll like it just because this is not just how to spot a liar, but I'm taking a lot of the true crime stories that I've worked on or I sat in the court with or I've analyzed in my own personal story of being a witness in a murder case when I was age 15. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, watch out for the book, everybody. You can see that. And then, of course, at CrimeCon, you can go and see Susan. Susan, do you have a website? Are you on the social yes. medias? It's www.susanconstantine.com. Dot com and my email is susan at susanconstantine.com all right big thanks again to susan who uh jumped in kind of interesting we could have talked quite a bit about how these uh juries are picked but thought we would um leave it there with you okay so before um we get to your questions and i know there's many questions i got some great pictures of tammy daybell from somebody who went to high school with her and I wanted to share those with you now. Uh, if you knew Tammy or JJ or Tylee and want to share a memory or photos or videos that you have of them, every night I like to go back and um, it's one of my favorite parts of doing this program is um, talking about and sharing who these people were uh, because I never met them and most of us have never met them, but we feel like we know them. And... Um, this is a way I guess we can kind of get to know them. Look at these high school yearbook photos. Tammy Douglas at the time. She's one tough chick. Tammy Douglas was born in Pasadena, California, and has lived in Springville ever since the seventh grade. One of Tammy's favorite pastimes is to talk on the phone. All of her friends will attest to this. She also likes to drive her car, freak people out, quote, and to be anywhere with friends. To many people, Tammy is known as TC, or Tough Chick. This nickname originated when she was younger, and her uncle and her brother would beat her up, beat on her, beat up on her. She wouldn't take it and always fought back. After having thought back on numerous occasions, she decided to try to scare them off with the meanest look she could muster up. So she gave them her Tough Chick look, and ever since then, she has been known as TC. Tammy is one of those people who have bubbly personalities and was and are always fun to be around. She is widely known throughout the school and makes friends easily. Just whatever you do, don't get her mad because she's the one tough chick. Oh, that's so great. Doesn't that just kind of show you this other side of Tammy, what she was like in high school and how she was and... Um, what a what a what a great woman. So tonight we remember Tammy and we remember JJ and Tylee and Charles Vallow as well as his trial will well the the trial for Lori Vallow his ex-wife will begin soon soon ish. I don't know if it'll be this year but maybe next year. Hey, I want to remind you that you can follow us and follow me if you want on uh my Facebook, on Instagram, on X and on YouTube. Now, all throughout the trial, I will be posting minute-by-minute minute updates. I've been doing it thus far. I know many of you are new. I did it during Lori Vallow's trial. If you want to watch the trial, great. If you want to read updates, great. Here's how you can do them both. Starting every day at 8.30, not tomorrow, but on Wednesday. Every day going forward at that point, 8.30 a.m., the trial starts. And... If you can't watch and want to just read, I'll also be posting live updates on eastidahonews.com or my X feed, my Twitter account. Then, of course, every night we'll recap it all here. And then we have a comprehensive video library that will store all of the witness testimony, all of everything said in court that's public that the judge allows. We will put that on our YouTube. And if you're like, oh, no, I can't watch it live. Can I watch it later? Of course you can. You can also go back and listen to all of the Lori Vallow stuff if you're interested in that. So there's kind of how you can follow this along. I know for many of you, you've, you've been you're like, Nate, you say this every night. I know I do. And I feel like I'm repeating myself, too. But I just know that there's a lot of people that are new and joining in. So don't want to forget them. Okay, so here we go, and I've already some of you are sending me beautiful photos of the eclipse, so thank you, and it's it's really cool because I, I feel kind of connected to you all, even though we're, we're all over the world. Okay, whoa, lots of questions. Um, have you ever seen Chad's dark and light list? If so, w were any of his kids on it? I have seen it. I don't have it, but I've seen it, and I've had it described to me, and as far as I know, his kids were light. 
um, as far as I remember, his kids were light. I, I don't remember much. I believe that Oprah Winfrey was the darkest person on the scale um, as far as evil, you know. Uh, but I, I've, I don't have a copy of it. And if I did, I'd share it with you. I think Justin Lum had a copy and showed it or part of it. They never brought it up. I mean, they did bring it up. They never showed it in Lori's trial. But Chad's could be a whole different story. Because it was Chad's. Chad came up with that list. So we might actually see it in court. Courtney, can jurors have their cell phones but just have them off? No, the cell phones stay in the jury room. I believe that they can check them during breaks. I'll have to ask Tom that, but you can't bring them in the courtroom. Dayton, have you ever been to one of these trials and heard a phone go off in the gallery? If so, what happens? Oh, yes, Dayton. Not me. Thank goodness. Uh, They immediately take the phone and you don't get it back till the break. Um, and it is like this. I mean, it is, there's no messing around. Even if your phone like buzzes, they are very strict on that. I just want to say, I am so glad judge Boyce lets us have our phones and computers because other trials, I've talked to other reporters in the Alex Murdoch trial. You couldn't bring in a phone or a computer. All the reporters had to lot like handwrite everything. Granted, it was televised, so you could do it outside of the courtroom, but it's, it's a different feeling. Like, if I had to go in that courtroom every day, I'd want to be there. But if I had to handwrite everything, I I would, my arm, my hands would fall off. I um, <laughs> I have a little daddy and son journal that my son and I, we write back and forth. It's a little book we got for Christmas. And I write one page in there that takes five minutes. I'm like, oh, my hand's sore. I'm just so used to typing. So, um, yeah, you can't, you can't have a phone. Also, last time... Someone held up a phone like this, and they tell us now, when you get in there, you cannot hold up your phone like above the bench or my computer. Anytime we're asked to stand, you have to put everything down. A woman held up a phone like this, and during Lori's trial, she said she was figuring out something, and they kicked her out for the whole trial. Judge Boy said no. They thought she was taking a picture of Lori. Maybe she was, maybe she wasn't. I don't know. But you can't, like, when you walk in the courtroom, you can't be like, let me see if I can get a signal. You have to, you have to put it down. Have you ever watched the show Jury Duty? It's about a man who doesn't realize he's on a show, a, on a jury. Hilarious. You should watch it. I have seen it. And I thought it was hilarious. And I watched it right after Lori's trial. So I'm like, oh, man, could you even imagine if this was true? <laughs> um, so if you haven't seen Jury Duty, it's pretty funny. It's a guy. Everyone in the show is an actor except him. He, th- he shows up for jury duty. It was a casting call, but it was jury duty. And they tell him they're doing like a behind the scenes type show. So there's going to be cameras. And it's just crazy. Everything that can happen happens. I heard they're going to do a season two. I don't know how they're going to pull that off, but it would be hilarious. I'd love to be a part of it. Just like <laughs> maybe, maybe I could do courtroom insider for the fake jury show. I don't know. That might be journalistically not right, but. Anyway, Gail asks if I'm going to go to Arizona to cover Lori's trial regarding Charles. Yes, I will be there, assuming that it happens not during Chad's, and I don't think it will, but I'll be there. During juror interviews, two jurors didn't come back when they were supposed to. Do you know what happened to them, if anything? Also, can Chad have visitors during his stay for the trial? Um, the two jurors that didn't show up, they showed up the next day and they explained why they were late. They didn't get fined or anything. In fact, as I mentioned a minute ago, one of them actually ended up on the jury. So they they didn't impact them. Chad cannot have visitors. In fact, I don't think the Ada County jail allows any in-person visits. It's all on video. If I recall correctly, that's how it is in other jails. Uh, But Chad can only see his attorney. That's it. I don't know if he could even see clergy. I don't think so. If he had a, like a, a pastor or somebody he wanted to see. Is there anyone associated with the case that you'd like to interview that but haven't? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, the big one would be Lori. And maybe that'll happen one day. And that's all I'll say. And Chad. And maybe that'll happen one day. I don't know. But um, I'd also love to talk with Chad's kids. And I, I, I hope that I could be fair and hear them out. Uh, there's a couple of people in Chad's family. We, we haven't really heard much from Chad's side. We've, ha- we've heard from Lori's side a little bit um, and JJ and Tylee, their, their side and whatnot. But Chad's side has kind of not been explored just because a, a lot of them are, are 
really talking, but I would hope to interview some of them one day. I think when the trial's over, maybe. Where are Chad's parents at? Joyce asks. Well, they live in Springville. They have not come to the trial and they've remained quiet. And those are two people I'd love to talk to as well. Imagine that this this has probably just shaken up their world like nothing else. And so they've just chosen to remain quiet. Uh, But it's possible they'll probably watch. If and when Chad is found guilty and the jurors go into deliberations, what happens if they do not get a unanimous vote for the death penalty? Does that constitute a hung verdict, as in a jury trial? Would they have to start over and would another trial happen? I'm assuming in Idaho we have to have a unanimous vote for all jurors. Is that correct or is it majority? It is unanimous. If one juror in that group does not believe that Chad should be put to death, He's not put to death. Now, the verdict has to be unanimous, too. It's They've got to be guilty there. Um, so on, on well, on certain charges, they're, they're, they could come back guilty on this charge, not guilty on this charge. Lori, it was across the board. But on the, so they, everyone has to agree. But on the, and I guess you could say everyone has to agree on the death penalty, too. But if you, there's even one holdout, it's life in prison. That Those are the only options. Amy says, if Chad was ever to ask for a plea agreement, does that automatically take the death penalty off the table? Well, it would depend on the plea agreement. It would depend on the agreement. If he if he comes out and says, I'm going to plea, I think the only way that he wins at this point is by taking death penalty off the table. They would have to say, okay, you have to agree to these terms. But if you, the, the prosecution definitely has the leg up at this point. I mean, we've got a jury. This starts the day after tomorrow. And if they're going to be like, yeah, here's your terms. You plead guilty to all of it. We'll take death off. You serve life. Done. Uh, If not, no. Or maybe they say you serve three 90-year sentences in a row or something like that or three 50-year sentences. But I think at this point, they're ready. They're ready to move. They're ready to do this trial. Kathy says, who pays for the trial? Does every county chip in two? Does Ada County pay two? Good question. Ada County will probably pay a little bit, but Fremont County? They're the lead in this one and Madison County. They have to. So think about Lindsay Blake. She's got to earn her salary. So Fremont pays for her. Rob Wood, Madison pays for his. Uh, Ada County would probably pay some of it, but a lot of the, the deputies and sheriffs and police officers from Eastern Idaho are here in Boise. So they're paying for that. Uh, all the fees. It's really the majority of the costs are going to be Fremont County and Madison County. Lori Vallow's trial, I think, cost 1.8 million we have a frequently asked questions page um let me pull it up really quick i think the preparation for Lori vallow's trial for both both trials together it was like 3 million up until that point and um the actual trial was Okay, here we go. Lori and Chad's case cost taxpayers $3.6 million between 2019 and 2022. That wasn't even last year when it went to trial. This includes personnel, investigation costs, and other expenses with law enforcement, the prosecution, and public defenders. Prosecutors estimated moving the trials to Ada County will cost Madison and Fremont County an estimated $300,000 more, but that was before the trials were severed. And then I believe that the actual trial the actual trial trial for Lori was like over a million dollars. It's pricey. And I know the next question is going to be, do Chad and Lori have to pay it back? Well, I guess you could order that from the judge. They'll, they'll have be ordered to pay fines and uh, probably money to the victims and things like that. But where are they going to get that money? I mean, it's, it won't get paid back. Deborah, why, when you remember the victims, do you leave Charles out? I've been asked about that, Deborah. I I don't like do it to be mean or anything. It's simply because Charles, his trial is separate from this one. I mean, they're all kind of connected, but he, Chad and Lori are not facing charges in Idaho for Charles's death. That one's in Arizona. These trials, the victims in these trials are J.J. Tiley and Tammy Daybell. But I did include one with Charles last night, and I'd love to to honor him too. So I please don't you know take it as I'm purposely leaving out Charles because I'm not. It's just that's just kind of how it was. But but I'd be happy to include Charles more. Uh, a couple more questions: Are Larry and Kay planning to stay the whole trial? 
Um, I believe so. I think they had a family obligation, like a graduation in mid-May that they, if the trial's still going on, they're going to leave for that, but they should be here. Beverly, as Chad leaves, do security guards shackle him? I have not seen him leave the courtroom because they have, they have, they've had all the, everybody in the gallery leave before him, but I'll watch next week. He has not had on shackles or handcuffs. Can you put the BK, T, BTK daughter in touch with the Daybell kids as to how to move forward from here from Jennifer? That's a good, good, uh, observation, Jennifer. I, I do, I have met the BTK daughter. Uh, I have met her briefly at CrimeCon, but I'd be happy to. Wanda, what if I miss the whole thing? Will it be online if I miss the whole day? Yes, absolutely. Yep, you can get caught up. Uh, Gail and Carrie, has Chad had problems with the police prior to meeting Lori and Alex? No, his record is like clean as a whistle. I think there was one traffic infraction at one point, but that was it. Where do the alternates sit in the courtroom? Good question. All the jurors sit together. There's 18 seats. When they arrive on Wednesday, they'll all get new numbers, 1 to 18. They'll sit in those seats, and they'll sit there every day. And that's how we will know them for the next 8 to 10 weeks. And then at the end, one could be the alternate. Wouldn't that be interesting if, if the very first one picked from the very first group makes it all the way and ends up being an alternate? They will choose a foreman among themselves. The judge will give them instructions on, on Wednesday the jury instructions will probably be like 30 minutes to an hour. There's a lot, a lot of, of jury instruction. And then it will go right into openings. Um, in California, the son of Sam laws don't allow any felons to make money off of their victims. Is this true where you are? Yeah, you can't. So if Lori and Chad were to write a book, do a documentary, do an interview, whatever, they could not make any money off of it. They're called the Slayer Laws in Idaho. Some states don't have those type of laws, but Idaho does. Okay, I think we got through, well, not all the questions, but the questions that we have tonight. Again, you can follow me here. Hope to see you there. Um, Facebook, Instagram, X, and YouTube. Somebody, somebody messaged me and said, I had no idea that you were on Let's Make a Deal and The Price is Right. We were, my wife and I, years ago, and they found it on our Meet and the Eaton's YouTube channel. So I'm also streaming it on that channel. That's more personal type stuff. This sticks to the case. But yes, I, I was on. I, we won the big deal. We picked curtain number three. And it was two trips. And we went home at, like three weeks later and found out that Erica was pregnant with our first. And you have to pay the taxes up front on those shows, which it was like $7,000 or something crazy. And we couldn't afford that. And you had to take both trips within a year. Anyway, we declined both of the trips. We had to turn them down. So, yes, thank you for those, those of you that watched that clip. I was a sock monkey. No, I was a banana. Erica was a sock monkey. I'm getting off track. It must be time for dinner. Thank you all for watching. We'll be back tomorrow. So we are going to do a courtroom insider tomorrow, even though there's, there's no court. I want to go back and look at the opening statements that happened in Lori Vallow's case, both on the prosecution and the defense. And then we'll have that fresh in our minds for the next day when opening statements happen. So we'll still be here tomorrow. Don't know if we'll go a full hour, but if you have a lot of questions, happy to you know take those into account. Um, so please, back here tomorrow night, 6.30 Mountain Time. If you have Eclipse picks, post them below. We'd love to see them. Thank you all so much for watching. Really appreciate it. And I hope you have a great night. See you tomorrow. <laughs>